Our guests later on the show today are the first two have a story to tell about God's grace in the valley. They both experienced things that were radically impactful to their lives and Beth and Dave Weichel bring a message called The Way of Hope and Amy Lynn shares her story behind the mask. And then while we're still in Human Trafficking Awareness Month, we have a follow-up story to last Monday's features on human trafficking where we will have Nita Bellis from In Our Backyard uh, as a follow-up story to this very pressing issue about human trafficking and human bondage in sex trafficking and slavery. As I look out over my own life and my own testimony, I have known betrayal as the valleys of my life, those really low places. I think back to right after the time I became a believer and I was in a very successful business. I had a partner. We had three divisions of the company. We were in software, we were in staffing, and we were in outplacement, just particular business we were in. We had created a software product that was very widely accepted. And one day I came into the office and I walked in and the office administrator was sitting at her desk crying. Now, she had been with my partner for 25 years prior to the merger of our two companies. We were about five years into our relationship, so she had worked for him for 30 years. Knew him and his family extremely well. But she's sitting there at the desk crying. And I asked her what was wrong. And she looked at me and she said, everything's gone. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, what happened? Was there a fire? Was, what, what, was, this, was anybody home at the time? And she said, no, you don't understand. Everything is gone. And I said, I, I don't understand. What are you talking about? She said that my partner had taken all the funds, cashed in all of our receivables, borrowed against them, and took all the money. And we were basically in financial ruin. And I was devastated. And I was a young believer. I didn't really know what the appropriate response was. I just knew that I was kind of instructed while I was being discipled to call my support system. And so I called those who were in my support system and I expected them to tell me to call the DA, to call the police, to begin legal proceedings, to even to the point of hiring a bunch of thugs to go after him. Yet the counsel that I received kind of knocked me off my feet. And the counsel I received was that if I forgave him, then God would deal with him. My response to that was, well, how will I get my money back? And they said, God will vindicate you. And it was a concept I didn't understand at the time. I didn't understand the concept of grace and mercy and loving kindness. I had been a believer for just a few short years and I'd read through the New Testament many times at that point. I knew the story of Judas. I knew the words of Jesus, forgive them for they know not what they do, but I was no Messiah. What power did I have in forgiving him? What God would allow this to happen and then want me to release it back to him? But I was a teachable student of the word. And I went home and devastated. Everything was gone. I had no idea how I was going to repay the financing that we had received or 
how I was going to tell everyone that the business was gone and let all the employees know that they no longer had jobs. What was I going to do for a living? How was I going to take care of my daughter? And I remember sitting in a button chair, uh, swiveling back and forth, swiveling back and forth and crying out to God. And I began to see this picture of Jesus standing on the Mount of Beatitudes and saying, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you to bless those who curse you, to pray for those who despitefully use you. If your enemy takes your shirt, give them your cloak too. If he strikes you on the left cheek, turn also the right. If he forces you to walk one mile, walk two. Give to the one who asks you of you. Feed your enemy. And it's like heaping hot coals on his head. I like that part. The hot coals part. But as I began to look in the word about betrayal... I was reminded of Matthew 6, 14 and 15, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And I very desperately wanted my sins to be forgiven. I was past the age of 45. I had lived a life in the world and I really wanted all the things that I had done wrong to be wiped away. And I began to realize at that time that as long as I had my hands around the throat, not physically, but spiritually, around my partner's neck, that the Holy Spirit was a gentleman and would not pry this man from my hands, but I had to release him. I had to let him go so that God could perform whatever justice he chose to perform. It was a hard lesson. It was bitter and it was sweet. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I came to the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and I read the words that said, I have seen your good works, your great works, but this I hold against you. You have forsaken your first love. Look at the heights from which you have fallen. And I thought, okay, how does that apply to me? Here I was the president of a conglomerate. I was going to go back out there and seek jobs as president. Once a president, always a president. It was the time of the software boom in Atlanta, and I thought, my goodness, I've already run a software company. We've created all this. I can go back out there and do it again. And so I began to network, and at every turn, I was turned away. Every door closed, closed in my face. And I kept going back to Revelation chapter 2. It said... You've forsaken your first love. And I knew God wasn't talking about the Holy Spirit. I knew God wasn't talking about God. I had just given my life just several years ago to the Lord and was in the synagogue every chance I got and at every Bible study I could be at. What could he possibly be talking about? And the Lord said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. How did that apply to me? How is that going to get me and land me a job? How is that going to get me out of the literally hundreds of thousands of dollars that I was on the hook for? How was God going to use humility as a path of restoration in my life? I was in a deep pit, not a valley. It wasn't a valley of despair, it was a pit of despair. 
the job search software that my team developed was on my computer. And it suddenly occurred to me that if I'm looking for a job, why wouldn't I use my own software? And I began to look for jobs as president and vice president and even as uh, executive director and nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And I prayed, Lord, show me. Show me the way I should go. I remember the words of Jeremiah that when you come to the crossroads, choose the ancient path. And there you will find your peace. And I thought the ancient path, the ancient path, I'm already walking with the Lord. I'm living the fullness of my Jewish lifestyle, but now I have the Messiah. What more could I do to embrace the ancient path of God? But the message for me wasn't the ancient path of the patriarchs. It was where my career began. My career began in sales. And I thought to myself, how horrible would that be to go from a presidency of a sizable company to becoming a salesman again, to start over, to start over in my 40s. But I heeded the word of the Lord, and I put in the search string for sales and one job was a match. And I looked at the job. And the job was clearly beneath me. But I had remembered the admonition of the Lord to humble myself. And so I filled out the online application. Within about an hour and a half, I got a phone call from that company and they said, when can you come in an interview? I said, when would you like me to come in? And they said, well, can you be here in 15 minutes? I was stunned by that. I said, certainly. I went and I had the meeting with the sales manager and he said, can you stay for a minute? And I said, certainly. And he said, uh, come, I want you to meet the president of the company. And so he escorted me to the president's office and we had a conversation and I returned to the sales manager's office and he said, well, we'd like to bring you on board. When can you start? And I said, when would you like me to start? And he said, can you start now? And I was, now? Certainly. I'm looking for a job. So I started there. I took the position. And in a couple of weeks, the president of the company called me into his office and said, uh, there was something that I couldn't tell you. We were in the quiet period, but we were, were being acquired by a larger company. And you're going to not be a sales rep or salesman for this company. Uh, they want to put you in charge of their retail division. I thought, how interesting. I've only been here for a couple of weeks. And they said, we want you to go over and meet with them and start reporting to their offices. I said, okay. So I went over, I met with them, and they showed me where I would be sitting, and I began to work for the new company. After the transition was made and the two companies were now one, I was called into the president of that company's office and had a conversation quite similar to the first conversation I had with the president of the first company. And he said, I wasn't able to tell you this because we were in the quiet period, but we are being acquired by Hewlett Packard and they would like you to become their director of strategic marketing. Only six or seven weeks had gone by since I humbled myself and applied for a lowly sales position. And here it was, short of two months, and I was being restored by God. Now I was the director of strategic marketing for Hewlett Packard. 
I never would have seen that coming. I had to be obedient to what God told me to do. For his word says obedience is better than sacrifice. But God had thrown me a lifeline and I had to be willing to grab a hold of what he gave me in order to pull myself up out of the circumstance that I was in. And by the way, during that time I met with my partner and I remember the lunch that I had with him as I sat across from him and when I requested the lunch with him he told me it had to be in a public place and he sounded very nervous and I guess he thought if I was in private that I was going to do something to him. But I sat across from him and I opened up the conversation with the words, do you mind if I pray? And he said, no. I said, uh, but before I pray, I just want to let you know that I forgive you. And it was as if I saw somebody transform from healthy and vibrant to almost white, ashen, like the blood had drained from his body and I had never seen fear take over, consume a person. And as I looked at him, he said to me, what do you mean by that? I said, I mean simply that I forgive you, I release you. I hold nothing against you. God has provided for me a way out. Certainly I will suffer with some consequences from your decision, but I release you. I've washed my hands of holding anything against you. And maybe I've done the best thing for you, but then again, maybe I've done the worst thing for you, and that's that I've handed you over to my Father in heaven. That was the last time I saw him. Unfortunately, six weeks later, he suffered a devastating stroke and shortly thereafter passed away. I truly wished him no harm. I really had forgiven him and to this day I still forgive him for the path that God had me on led me to having an experience of seeing God's hand of restoration, his grace and his mercy play out in my life. It wasn't that many years ago that I faced another betrayal. A betrayal that would change the course of my life forever. That betrayal took me to the desert. To complete solitude for a period of almost one year. Where literally I only talked to the Lord and three people. But during that time God was quite active in preparing the way for me to be fully restored for I was betrayed in such a way that there were things hidden in darkness that were all brought out into the light during that period of silence. I never defended myself, I never spoke out to champion my own cause because God was faithful to vindicate. And there's many verses in the Bible about vindication. And I prayed those verses every day. It was during that time that my second book was birthed and God gave me a supernatural download for writing the Codist. I found a publisher and it was released. This ministry was birthed out of that time in the desert. It has prospered and reached thousands of people with the gospel, taken hundreds of people to Israel, changed countless lives, introduced me to marvelous and wonderful people along the way, and they're the ones that birthed this broadcast center all in a supernaturally short period of time. See, there's lessons God wants us to learn through the fire, through the refining, through the difficulty. For some, it's a season of 40 years like it was for Moses, who 
it took God 40 years to get Moses out of Moses. He didn't use him again until he was 80. Or a season like Joseph had to go through the refiner's fire in order to be put in place as second in charge of Egypt. For none of the things he had done that he was accused of doing, he was falsely accused. But he did not ever defend himself. And as Jesus' life unfolded, and he was accused of things, he did not defend himself. So much so that it says, like a lamb led to slaughter, there was no sound that came from his mouth. God will use the seasons of our lives. The same way King Solomon said, for everything there is a season. There are seasons to plant and seasons to harvest. There are seasons to grow, seasons to be refined. I'm always reminded of the sequoia trees the redwoods out in California. They have these monstrous sized pine cones and they don't break or shed their seed on the ground until the fire comes. And the fire has to be a forest fire of such intensity, of a certain amount of heat, that it causes the cone to explode. And when it explodes, it casts its seed out and it rises on the thermals and is carried out to repopulate the forest. We too must be like that seed that falls to the ground and dies to our old self to bring about new life. God's grace is sufficient to carry us through every trial, through every test, and to embrace it. And there's two basic principles, that if our life is in, is in sin, God will discipline us. But if our life is not in sin, God will prune us. And pruning certainly hurts, but he'll prune us to bring about new growth. He will take people out of your life. He will remove them because they are not beneficial to your life. And you will have a personal, emotional, or physical attachment to that person, but God will bring much more if we let him. I'm always reminded of that picture of us lifting our hands up to the Lord and realizing that we can only lift as this far. Our limitation of reach is the hand, end of our fingers. And God makes the rest of the trip down to grab a hold of our hands. God promises he will never leave us or forsake us that every good gift comes from God. Job said it best, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I share these stories with you because these are stories of testimony, stories of the unlimited, unconditional love of a father who sent his only son to give us the strength to endure, to grab hold of that which he has grabbed hold of for us. That if we pray his word, his word will not return void. That he will never tempt us beyond what we're capable of and he will always give us a way out of every circumstance if we just seek him first. As the word says, seek him first and all of his righteousness and them, and it's an order, seek him first and then all this will be given unto you. If you have comments or questions, give us a call at 205-558-5100 or toll free, 888-988-9673. We're talking about life in the valley. Not the valley of despair, but the valley of life, which is lush and green and where life happens, where when you look at the fertile deltas all over the world, they are in the valley and there's a mountain close by. And the snow melts on the mountain top, but it trickles down to nourish the rich land, 
to wash the soil down to give good topsoil to make the land and the valley fertile. In Israel, it takes eight and a half months from the snow on Mount Hermon to melt and make its way through the filtration system of the mountains until it comes into the headwaters of the Jordan River. Eight and a half months of purification before it makes it to the bottom, into the valley. And there, there are three headwaters that feed into the Jordan River. And the Jordan River flows into the Galilee and the Galilee flows back out. And the Jordan River picks up back again and flows into the Dead Sea. And so in that place between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, you have this moving body of water that takes you and the place of immersion where John the Baptist, John the Immerser was and immersed Jesus, where I take people each year on our annual Israel trip and immerse them in that water, we see a perfect picture of what God does because he washes that sin from us and as we are in that flowing living water in the valley, in the lowest point on earth, we see that he takes it to a place where no life exists from the living waters of the Jordan River to the Dead Sea. That's why it is that place that God chose for immersion, for baptism. It takes it to the lowest point on earth where life does not exist. The salt water in there is some 15 times what our oceans are where you cannot open your eyes in the waters of the Dead Sea or you will literally burn them. God takes us to the valley. He leaves us there to grow. Throughout the Bible we read of only a few instances of the mountaintop experiences. Moses certainly made his trips up to meet with God. He met Elijah on the mountain. He will give us mountaintop joys, but we do return to the valley, and this is what these psychologists call that kind of set point as we get back to life as usual. We would call it manic and depressive if we were looking at people who had big highs and big lows, but life is fairly steady for most because God is steady. And while we are in the valley, not the valley of despair, but the valley of everyday life, we are being strengthened and nourished by his word so we may be prepared when that attack does come. How are we to respond to such tragedies as the death of a child? The death of a spouse, murder, rape, trauma. How can we survive these devastating emotional attacks? That's what our guest today will be talking about, at least our first two. Dave and Beth Weichel will talk about the way of hope growing close to God through loss. Loss can bring you closer to God if you let God be your way out. I found that experience twice in my life that I was at the end of me. And that's where God began to work in my life. He was the one that led me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So I walked in the valley of the shadow of death, but I did not fear evil, for God was with me. And he sent the great comfort of the Holy Spirit to carry me through. That year in the desert that I took not so long ago, three and a half years ago, took me into the word where 
I was not only reading the Word every day, but I was listening to it. And it only takes 70 hours to listen to the entire Bible. In Genesis through Revelation, 70 hours spoken. And so I downloaded an app and I would take walks and I would work in the field and I would fish and I would walk the property. Praying the whole time, listening to the Word over and over again until I understood King David who said thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you O God that it brought life to my bones and I was no longer weary he provided the path out and the day of restoration came as I was called to preach on Holy Week at a very large old church here in Birmingham. It happened to be at the request of the person who I went to for counseling that specialized in counseling pastors, especially pastors who had been betrayed. At the end of my time with him, which was relatively short, he said, I want you to take this time that's been given to you and I want you to come back to the pulpit in my church. And that had a validating, a tremendously validating effect on me as here it was, my pra trained professional counselor was, not only was he releasing me from counseling, but he was blessing me by opening up his own church's pulpit to me. Not for one day, but for two days, the Wednesday and Thursday before Good Friday. That week for that church is a week of high honor. They bring theologians in from all over the world, yet they gave me two, two slots. And almost a year in advance. And I took that as a sign from God that everything was going to be all right. A word of comfort that I had been vindicated and God continues to vindicate, God continues to bless, God continues to heal, God continues to restore. And as his word says, exceedingly and abundantly beyond all our expectations. Even in time of pain, the time of trouble, God is just as close. And he even gives you his phone number in the Bible in Jeremiah 33, 3. It's, that's his phone number. He says, call on me and I will answer you. If you're facing a difficult time in your life, if you feel like you are in despair and there's no way out. It's a message from God to grow closer to him. His word says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. For some it may be a last resort. Although we are to seek him first, it may be your last line of defense, but it's never too late. To call upon the one that sacrificed for you. When we return from our break, we'll be joined by Dave and Beth Weichel, authors of The Way of Hope, sharing a very poignant story with us and even offering to you and your church the opportunity to have them come and share a life changing workshop that they put on. We are not immune as believers to trouble, to strife, to heartache, but we have the blessed hope and promise in our Messiah that he will sustain us with his outstretched right hand. You're watching the Revealing the Truth right here on the United Nation Broadcast Network. All of our programs are replayed on our YouTube channel at Igniting Nation. We'll be right back.